Hi, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. We're so blessed to have Father Damien Quigley, who is a priest from Ireland, from the Archdiocese of Armagh. And um, Father Damien and I, this is our first time to actually see one another and talk um, because we've been Facebook messaging for years. You've yeah. been, you were one of the first people who found uh, our social media and mm -hmm. started interacting with us early on. And um, so today I'm, I'm wearing the shirt that you helped design, which was our One Priest Can Save the World. Um, and it's a priest holding up the chalice and the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And um, I sell it everywhere I go. I, I just think it's, it's um, so great that you're finally on today and that we get to talk. So welcome. Thank you. And as I said, it's just it's just it's absolutely amazing to be online. And I know even recently we've tried to, to line up our times, particularly with the time difference. But no, it is a true joy to be here um, and just to talk about priesthood, to talk yes. about priesthood. Amazing opportunity. Well, thank you so much. And tell us a little bit about yourself. Start us off. Did you grow up in a big family and be uh, devout no. Catholic from the beginning? Yeah, yeah, we were, um, well, it's Ireland, so we were all kind of, we were all born Catholic and baptized Catholic. Um, but, you know, I was born in 75. Um, I'm the youngest. Um, I have two older brothers and an older sister. She passed away about five years ago. Um, so I know she's she's here with me and keeping an eye on me. Um, my, my two older brothers joke that um, not only was I the youngest boy, but now I'm a priest. So my mother's eyes, that's like gold dust, the jackpot. I can do no wrong. Um, I know, like we we grew up, we we went to mass. The church, our home church, is like you look at our front door. There's a school, and up in the hill behind it is this massive church. Um, and I literally grew up in that church. I literally, like, I I remember so wanting to make my holy communion, not out of any deep understanding of the Eucharist, but just because that was my ticket to serving mass. You couldn't serve mass unless you made your first Holy Communion. And I really wanted to serve Mass. So I thought, great, I can make my first Holy Communion. Um, and then as I as I grew up, uh, we would go to Mass every Sunday. That was just part of part of our, our routine. And then I started getting more and more involved. So I started to proclaim the word at Mass. I started, started to be a Eucharistic minister. Um, kind of had that in the sacristy. Um, was sacristy and then to, to cover like summers and stuff like that and holidays. Um, they used to joke in my in my home parish that I did everything but say the mass. So when I eventually got to celebrate my first mass in the parish, I was like, "That's that box now ticked." Yeah. Um, so no, it was I. As I said, just I have so much um, respect and I treasure so much those years growing up um, in a great family, very close family. We were very very close to each other, um, but also then in a parish community that really nurtured me and kind of. Well, drop the subtle hints the odd time about you think about being a priest and you know and you know and so yeah that kind of it was it was always it was always in the background it was always um the one one way i described it is like an undercurrent in my life to call to to call the priesthood um and i did think about it when i was probably 17 or 18 and i was getting ready to go to out of high school um i talked to a couple of people about it and i just i thought no do you know something it's just not for me now. I'm just not now. Um, so I went off and, and I did my, actually my academic background is science, um, food science and microbiology and all that kind of stuff. So I did all that. Um, and then as you do at university, well, certainly over here at university, when you're getting ready to graduate, you apply to everywhere. You apply to like food companies, to banks, to uh, retail, which is where I, I eventually ended up. Um, and I got an offer from a company called Tesco, which is kind of like Walmart kind of equivalent um, to go work for them. So I joined them in the graduate program in 98, yeah, just after I graduated from university. And I spent 11 years with them, um, doing everything from kind of uh, like assistant store manager and covering holidays through to project management in head office, running our retail help desk, um, being out on the road a lot. I eventually ended up looking after our smaller stores and um, kind of trying to make them a wee bit more profitable. Um, and that got me to I was kind of 35 and again through it all the priesthood never left me I was still I would still go to mass I would still you know celebrate the sacraments and I started listening to a podcast called Pray Station Portable 
um, and I'm a gamer, so I love my PlayStation. So that kind of, I think that was a hook already. And that's how I learned to, to pray the office because I was driving a lot on the road and I used to pray morning prayer while I was driving and evening prayer and just got into that rhythm and it just became part of my day then. I'd actually look forward to getting into the car and being able to put on the podcast and go, right, I have an hour or two here now. First thing I'm doing is, is morning prayer. Um, and uh, yeah, it came, the opportunity came to, to leave Tesco. Um, and I thought, mm, I was 35 and I was like, Lord, maybe this is the time to go now. Um, and I remember there was, there was a, a priest friend of mine, a really, really good friend of mine. He's a Star Trek fan. So that was kind of a natural um, link for us. And um, he texted me one day and I was driving and please don't do this. This was wrong to do this. But he texted me and said, um, there's a vocation awareness weekend coming up. And um, would you like to go? So I'm driving along the motorway and I know I shouldn't have done this. But I opened my little uh, Sony Ericsson flip phone and I said, um, as the Lord himself said, why turn to me? My hour has not come yet. And his reply back was, well, don't forget what his mother said. Do whatever he tells you. And I always say to this day, if I can, I can't pinpoint a call, a moment of a call, but I can pinpoint a text message. That was a turning point for me. And I just went, you know something, if this is for me, I'm going to have to try it. I'm just going to have to give it a go and see. So off I went to seminary at age 35 in 2010, I think. Yeah. And I was ordained then in 2016. So you wouldn't necessarily, I mean, I don't know. I mean, they call them late vocation. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't I don't think you're really late. I think there are a lot of people who are, or a lot of priests who are even much later than you decide, mm -hmm. you know, this is it. So um, so how is seminary life like for you? Um, I really enjoyed it. I really, really enjoyed it. And I think part of it is, and I, and I say this to guys who I have this conversation with who are thinking about priesthood, like I went in going, if this isn't if this isn't for me, I trust the Lord to go right. I'm sending you here for a reason. If it's to make me a better man, for whatever then was coming next, fair enough. I say this particularly younger guys coming through. I said you may actually eventually be married, but maybe the Lord just needs to to knock off a few rough edges off you first. Um, and part of that is your own discernment. And I said maybe this is the way He's choosing to do it. Um, you know that you'd be a better man. You know, and, I, and I think, you know, like Aquinas said, grace builds on nature. I think you have to be a good man to be a good priest. I think that's, it's, I think Amen. that's a given. Amen. Absolutely. It's a given. Um, it was it was strange in seminary times because I came from a background where, particularly where I had a team working for me and I was kind of the manager um, and dealing in like millions of euros and kind of things to go on. Uh, can I go to the cinema on Friday night with the rest of my class? It was that kind of, it was, there was a strangeness in that going, yeah, okay, Lord, this is definitely, you know, kind of, yeah, just humble yourself a little bit, you know. Um, and there was a point in, in second year that I, I came close to going, nah, this isn't for me. This isn't for me. Um, at the time, I thought it was a very specific issue. Um, but thank God, my formation director at the time, he actually came back early from a weekend off to kind of have a chat with me. Um, and I said to him when I was ordained a priest, I said, you're one of the reasons why I stayed, because you came back. You to how important my call was um, to you and to the church and to the people of God. Um, and you helped me stay here. And when I look back at my my journal, my journaling over those kind of few weeks, yeah, there was a lot going on that I wasn't really processing. And he helped me with that. And with my um, vocational growth counsellor and my spiritual director kind of going, OK, yeah, I, I know now what's I have a better idea of what was happening around that time. Um, so, yeah. And then just that was it. No seminary. I had a great experience in seminary um, and and the the relationships you make, you know, classmates and and even now, while I would be really poor at keeping in contact with them, but you kind of know you can just pick up the phone or or just send them a quick test going, is this how you do this? Or, you know, is this like, what are we supposed to do here? Or um, so that's the kind of the network is still there. It's still there. Uh, because seminary think, doesn't train you for everything you're going to encounter when you're a priest, does it, Father? Absolutely not. I mean, you can't, I mean nothing, nothing can prepare you. Yeah. I'm sure for a married couple, you can do all the, you know, the accompaniment beforehand and all that. You know, but until you're you're in that marriage and you're, you know, you're encountering all these things, 
It's the same for us. I mean, there's like, I, and I, I think people people laugh, and I, and I laugh with them, but there's actually sincerity in it. Sometimes I go, I am literally going to have to Google that and see, because I'm not quite sure, or I'm going to have to go and make a phone call, particularly when it comes to weddings. Um, because I'm only still new at four years, I kind of go, yeah, I'm just going to have to check with somebody. But then I have people who I really, really trust, priests who are more experienced than I am, some of them really, really good friends now who I can pick up the phone and go, I, what am I supposed to do here? Or sometimes, what would you do here? Like one of the best pieces of advice I ever got from a priest, um, well, actually two pieces of advice. He said, never start with no. He said, 2,000 years, it's not the first time, you're not the first person to encounter this. So there is something already there. Um, and he said, when you're going on holidays, go where there's no expectation of you. Because, and rightly so, there is so much expectation of us in a parish. And that, you know, that's, we give our lives to our parish. Um, but he says, when you're on your break, he says, you go where there's no expectation of you. And that's, that has really stayed with me. Uh, yeah. Interesting. So um, I think that, you know, for married people, you know, so we, we get, you know, maybe we're engaged for a year, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that's right. Mm -hmm. Maybe. And uh, our pre cana maybe like six classes, seven classes, yeah. you know, maybe meet with the priest once or twice. You know, we, we're hopefully going to be changing that because that's not enough, obviously. No, no, no. But um, people look at our priests and knowing they're like six, seven, eight years of formation. Mm -hmm. That's so much time. And yeah. I, you know, and and it's and it's absolutely necessary for sure. But it 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 does. Uh, you go really. You're really not prepared for this. How wouldn't you know this? And yeah. and well, I said, there's no that. way when you're dealing with other human beings. First of all, there's no way you're going to yeah. be prepared for it all. And and, and the key, uh, two of the key things about formation that I learned is number one, it doesn't stop. Formation does not stop at the moment you are ordained your formation is continuing in a different way. And I, and I said this even in our parish, um, and I usually say once a year, actually around the time of my my first coming to the parish, I keep saying thank you for the way you're forming me as a priest because you have knocked off some rough edges off me. You have helped me. You have challenged me. You have embraced me. You have loved me. Um, so there's that element of kind of ongoing ongoing formation. But it's also the, the great um, beauty of this call, so you or this life, you don't know what's next. You don't know what's next. Um, and part of the challenge of it is that um, people will expect you to be a certain way. So you can go from like today, for example, being with a family whose father has died and, you know, preparing for the funeral to doing an interview here. And there's a different dynamic. There's a different emotion in all of that. Um, but then with, with really good formation, with ongoing spiritual direction and pastoral supervision accompaniment with another priest and that helps you kind of hold all that and also process it so that you don't get overwhelmed by the extremes of of the joys and the sorrows um because we, we are meant to we are literally in persona christi and he was i always say he was a very calm steady just you know so that's what we have to that's what we have to image as well for people you know, we, we need to be the rock in the storm at times. Oh, amen to that. And um, so so you said you're one of one of the those challenges. What about your joys of the priesthood um, about it? Um, this is such a cliche, but celebrating the Eucharist, celebrating Mass. Just well, that's a good cliche, Father. I mean, hello. <laughs> yeah, no, but people can sometimes people go like, oh, that's like the standard answer, but um, um, even today, like I'm constantly reminded that it's the most important thing I do every day. That everything else comes secondary to that. Is second to that. Um, and even like to with a, with a group I was with yesterday, and we were, you know, we've been all souls day, and I talked about resurrection, and I, I related him to like the day that I found out, um, or that I read a priest had written about that moment just before communion, um, where the host is broken. And a fragment is broken off and is placed in the chalice. And he called that a resurrection moment because the body and blood have been reunited. I just, even now, I just remember reading that. I actually, I, I sent it to my bishop on text going, wow, just to learn that about the Mass. And that's one of the great joys I have now. It's not, not just celebrating it, but learning what, in a way, learning beyond the practicalities of it. And, and 
going deeper into into the theology and obviously you know we, we get a lot of it in seminary but there's a lot of it going right it's over to you now and then being able to share that with people like a, i think it was last summer actually no earlier this year when we come back to public worship to people being with us again from us and um, for the first three or four weekends i said to people look i'm just going to put the readings aside and i'm going to just talk about different elements of the mass because it's a long time since we've been together and I just want to highlight, and a lot of that was my own learning and my own kind of, I, I love it so much that I want to share it with people. I said, this is not just a gathering. This is not just a, show, a social gathering. This is, yeah, this is our life. I think that's beautiful. I know that that was, um, the pandemic was, mm -hmm. was really hard there for you um, and because I would follow you on social media and uh, I know you were one of one of the first priests you know to make sure that everybody was represented in the in the parish in the pews and you were I, I know that you were very heartfelt in um, yeah. some of your your posts on on that and how hard that was as a priest yes. to not be able to celebrate mass yeah. because mass one of the key elements of mass is a dialogue between the priests and the people entrusted to him um, before the God who loves them. Um, and not to have the people there, not to, um, you know, even even to say the Lord be with you and not to hear anything back. Um, and that's one of the first things I spoke about when, when we come back to, to public worship was, I said, when you say, and with your spirit, I said, that's reminding me to be who I'm called to be. So yes, I've come out of this arc, I said, maybe I got a phone call about something or there's hassle or something or my mind, you know, when I hear that at Mass, that reminds me, and with your spirit, be who you are supposed to be. Be our priest now. And ever since, even now, goosebumps again, but ever since I read that and I learned that and I, I absorbed that, I thought, yeah, that's what that response is. And then to have that taken away was a huge challenge. Was a huge challenge. Um, and we are we are there for the people. Now we find, and we have found other ways of reaching out, um, but it's not the same. It's not the same. Yeah, you give, um, you started doing a nightly, night prayer, so night prayer at 10.30 yeah. p.m. your time in Ireland. So it's during the day here, but um, I think it's just beautiful that some of this has stayed with us, that, yeah. that, that there's more faith injected throughout our day yes. because of, uh, of this. And I hope some of that stays. Yeah, and, and it's... I, I, one, I mean, one of the reasons I started was to reach out to people because um, I'm very open with my even like my with my mobile number and my social media that, you know, I said look, people can follow me because I do. I try and particularly Facebook. I try and use it to evangelize. I thought, you know, um, something that I don't live that interest in of a life. So, you know, but you always get things up there about like Whitney Houston or Formula One or Star Trek or something, you know, um, but it's mostly about faith, you know, and, and trying to evangelize. And it was kind of reaching out to those people. And I thought, OK. Other than my parents, I might have a couple of other people on it. But it's just, you know, there might be 20 people who join me. And then when I look at it the next day, there's like 50 or 60 people have watched it and have engaged with it. Um, and I think it's it's a way to remind people that we're not just Catholic on a Sunday. That this is meant to be throughout our day. This is meant to define who we are. Um, I remember even at the start of the pandemic saying to people, this is going to be really, really difficult. But I said, if anybody knows how to do this, it's us because we have always preached and we have always lived. We before me. And I said, we before me. That's what we're being called to do now. This is for the common good. So we got to do this and we got a witness to it. Um, so, yeah, no, it is. And it, it's it's an opportunity for me as well to pray with people at night time, literally before I kind of wind down and hopefully get to bed. So tell us, how, how, how can the laity support you as a priest how, or how to support their own priest, you, their own priest, whomever, mm -hmm. you know, whom, whatever priest is in their life? What's the best way they can support them? First of all, pray for them. I always say to people, please just pray for me. And sometimes I find to go, why is there something wrong, Father? I'm like, no, but just pray for me. You know, I, and um, even like at Mass, when, you know, we, we, we lift up the host and we say, this is my body. I said to people at Mass, that's my commitment to you that I will give you everything that I am and everything that everything I can um to be to be your priest but you need to pray for us you need to pray um and I think as well to both affirm our priests and um, the great job that they're doing absolutely amazing um like 
it's easy for priests sometimes to get caught up in the non-essentials. And I always say, I was ordained to celebrate Mass, celebrate Sacrament of Reconciliation, and celebrate United of the Sick. They are the priority. So everything else has to come second to that. Um, but to affirm priests in that and to allow priests to be able to do that, that if a priest can't be doing X, Y, and Z because he's off celebrating reconciliation or he's, as a hospital chaplain, all the time being called to the hospital, then let him do that. Let him do that. The other things can wait. The other things can wait. Um, and also to look for people in the community who are our future priests. I, I said the Lord has not stopped calling people to priesthood. The world has got a lot more noisy, but we got a, it's a bit like the old days, you only like tuning in the radio. I say that to my nephews and they're like, well, I said, well, this is how we used to do it. But like tune in the radio amongst all the noise until you found the, the station that you wanted. We have to help our young men find that voice to find that station. And I've said to people, one of the ways you can do that is if you see somebody in your family, in your parish, in the community who has the the qualities that you would expect in a priest, say it to them. Like, don't go up and say, you'd be a great priest or you'd look great in black or whatever. It's actually, you know, Joseph or whatever, I see in you the qualities I'd expect to see in a priest. Because that's the way the Lord, somebody being called a priest, so they don't not to be a surprise to their community, to their family, to their friends. I know when I told my family, they weren't surprised. My two best friends I took out separately for a meal and one of them literally said, before you go any further, is this about priesthood? And I was like, yes. And they're like, oh, just go and do it. Sure. <laughs> I was like, I had this whole kind of speech prepared. And you're like, oh, no, it's just, yes. this is what That's you were amazing. called. This is who you were called to be. So, yeah. Um, That's look, for the, look for the people who need support with the call. Yes. So, Amen. Yeah. Well, um, I th so if somebody wanted to follow you on Facebook, they're going to find you at Father Damien Quigley. Father Damien Quigley. Yeah, I'm there. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so, and so, go find him at night prayer and uh, and all the uh, fun and interesting things that you share with everybody. It's so great to share at the two, it, because your priest is a person who has interest in um i think it's great that you share them with everybody father would you give us your priestly blessing please before you go i will if i can give one more plug if that's yes. okay yes um i also manage for our diocese i also manage our vocation promotion kind of social media so it's armar priest so the website is armarpriest.com and it's on instagram and facebook and twitter as well so anybody can can follow that um if if it's okay can i give you it in our native tongue in yes Irish? please yes okay okay so Goro and Tirna live. Gonadia El Kirkduk Shiv. Ahar Mak Aga Spirit Nave. Amen. And as I say at the end of every Mass, go in peace. Glorifying the Lord by your life. Amen. Thank you, God. Thank you so much, Father. God bless Thank you. you for this opportunity. God bless.